And now I've added a feature to my Universal QIC tape reader. This feature gives me full track alignment control. I noticed earlier on that sometimes the older tapes that I was reading, for example this one here, sometimes the older tapes that I was reading, what I expected to see on let's say track zero, I didn't see. And I didn't see anything. But when I switched to a different track, tracks one through eight, um, on one of the other tracks, I would see exactly what I expected to see on track zero. So I thought to myself, well, all right, it looks like the, uh, the tracks are aligned a little bit differently on this tape than they were in previous tapes. And even though, as far as I can tell, they were written by the same system, maybe uh, when the backup was done with this particular tape, that uh, the head alignment was off for one reason, one reason or another, or maybe the tape didn't get seated uh, quite the same way. Maybe it didn't get seated properly, and so the track alignment was off. Either way, I thought, well, I should be able to align the tracks manually so that I could get the best centered read on each track, particularly since I'm reading formats that are not the standard QIC 11 or QIC 24 that the Wang Tech 5099 is designed to read. These are the, uh, the en enigmatic Kennedy uh, QIC tape format, for lack of a better term. I don't know what it's officially called, but that's that's what I've determined that it is. So, for that and other track formats that do not adhere to the standard of QIC 11 and QIC 24, or even QIC 11 and 24 track formats where the alignment might be slightly off, um, this is very useful for that. Also, I noticed that Very slight changes in head alignment cause me to get a better read on areas like maybe a block uh, has a bad segment in it where the, the read wasn't a good segment. Changing the track alignment slightly did help get a few extra pulses in these cases. So the track alignment, the manual track alignment is really very helpful. So here's how this works. In here is a uh, logic stepper motor. I should just say a stepper motor, exactly like this. I took this out of another Wang Tech 1599 uh, tape drive. And I've determined this to be a um, 12 volt, um, four coil, six wire stepper motor. And I looked up some diagrams to figure out how the wiring on that worked. But in essence, there's six wires and there's four coils. and um, Maybe in another segment, I'll show the actual wiring diagram that I used for this. But I thought I should be able to isolate this from the circuit and then manually step it click by click, right? Or one coil advance after another so that I could make manual fine adjustments. And the way that this works, the way that the, the, the factory design for this is intended, is when the system is powered on and it goes to an initialization, this motor basically goes all the way, I guess it's, it's counterclockwise, it goes all the way counterclockwise until it can't go anymore. And that's that ratcheting sound you hear when we power the thing on. And that's basically this finding its home position. Well, it happens to be the head down as far as it can go against the stop. And then when we select these other tracks here, that head moves up evidently precise amounts, which is probably calculated by the circuitry in there that says so many, so many coil winding advances equals the adjustment from home position, initialized home position to track zero and track one and track two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, all the way through eight tracks. So I thought, well, if I could just, in the middle of that, in the middle of that, after it finds where it thinks track zero should be, maybe I can move it down 
a few clicks or a few revolutions, maybe half a revolution or one revolution, and that that would help the track alignment read better. And sure enough, it did. I'll probably do some future demonstrations where I actually hook an oscilloscope up to this and make the adjustment live while I'm moving the tape uh, to see exactly where each track begins or ends. But I'm not quite there yet. We'll, we'll do that in a future chapter. But <clears throat> I thought, well, if we isolate this from its circuit, which drives it, and then send independent pulses to this that don't interfere with the circuitry of the factory board because it's disconnected, rotate it, however many rotations I feel that need to, and then reconnect it back to the circuit, um, I should have manual control over that. And um, then the circuit can make adjustments from there if I decide to switch tracks. So what I started out by doing was getting double pole, double throw relays. These are 12 volt double pole, double throw relays. They're a little bit heftier than they need to be, but I basically put them in parallel. And so in essence, I have a six pole double throw switch, but it's just managed by relays. It was difficult for me to find a switch, but I had the, the relays easily available. And so that's why I use the relays. Now each of these wires, do go these right here. There should be 12 wires here. Six of them come from the board. And the other six connect to this connector right here, which is connected to the stepper motor in the tape assembly. Now, over here, I have four, that's right, four of those six wires that go to the motor connected to this rotary switch. Now, what this switch is, this switch is a single pole, 12 position rotary switch. Make sure you be able to see the connectors there. Single pole, so there's the center pole, and then there's 12 connectors all the way around it. Now what I've done with this switch is I removed the detent, which was just a ball bearing, and then there was a plastic stop on the inside of this that kept it from going any further, Pat, one, you know, that kept it from going around 360 degrees. So now I can actually turn it 360 degrees fairly smoothly. And at this point, it's actually making connections with each one of the 12 connectors there. So every time I make a full revolution, that's 12 connectors. Every time I make a half rec revolution, that's six different connectors. Well, in order for this motor to step through a cycle, in order for this motor to step through a cycle, it actually connects, it actually connects 12 volts to each of these four wires, which energizes one of the different coils at different points in time. And I've actually connected these four across three times. So as the wiper goes across, it connects one, two, three, four, then goes back to one, two, three, four, and goes back to one again, one, two, three, four. And that's how I have wired these. So it goes across the set of four three times in a full 360 degree revolution. I have made this a momentary switch because when these relays close, as they're doing right here, when these relays close, they're providing voltage to one of the coils depending on where this uh, 
where this rotating switch is, uh, with this rotating knob, rotating switch, is resting, right? So any of the coils, any one of the coils is receiving a full 12 volts. Well, I didn't want to forget and leave it on accidentally so that, you know, there was that constant 12 volts on the coil. That way I didn't forget to turn it off again. There's multiple um, good reasons, I think, to, to, to leave this be a momentary switch. So here's how this works. This right here is, is the head. And so we're looking at the connectors on the back side of the head. And the shaft, which, uh, the shaft which raises and lowers the head on the end of that um, stepper motor is right here. And you can see the top part of the shaft is right here. And the bottom part of the shaft is down further here. Okay, so we're going to see it in motion. It should become more obvious then. So we're going to power the device on, and it's going to basically initialize as far down as it can to its home position. So here we go. And there it is, initialized to its home position. So now I'm going to tell it to initialize the tape position, and then it should adjust itself to what it believes is logical track one. So logical track one. So watch this movement here. Okay, so there it is. It believes it's on logical track one. <clears throat> but what if its assumption about where track one is is too high or too low for where track one really is on the tape? Well, I simply hold down the switch over here on the control panel I showed you earlier, and I can rotate that. Did you see that move just a little bit? It moved just a little bit because the position of the switch was um, not exactly uh, in line with the coil that was energy. I should say it this way, the coil that was energized um, moved that slightly. Okay, so here I am. I'm going to move this down half a turn. Now, half a turn of uh, the actual shaft was a full turn of the knob. So here I do this again. I'm going to, I'm going to go down another uh, half a turn or a full turn of the knob. And it just moved just to ever so slightly amount. So you see, I have very fine control of this. Um, I'm going to move it up now, and I'm going to go a little bit faster so that you can see it. It actually is moving as I just twist, 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 twist. But anyway, and you should be able to see it right there, particularly right there as I move this. See that, that, that movement right there? Well, of course you do. Anyway, hopefully that's a little bit more evident about how that comes together. And this is actually a very successful adjustment for better reading of the tracks on this universal track reader device. And here I go, all the way down. And see, that's where it's uh, going. And now it's going all the way up. By the way, all this time I'm holding down the, uh, um, the switch as I'm holding, holding the switch in the on position as I turn this momentary switch and going all the way up. So it'll go full range. All right. And so, but now, it, the, the circuitry still thinks it's on track one, okay? So let's say, let's start this over again and just give a short demonstration. I'm going to power this off, power it back on again. There's initialization, and it's going to go to track one. And let's say that I have um, done experiments and I figured out that I want to actually go down uh, a turn and a half of the shaft, or three turns of the knob. So here I go. One turn of the knob, half turn of the shaft, two turns of the knob, one turn of the shaft, three turns of the knob, a turn and a half of the shaft. Now, you saw that go down. So now I'm actually going to want to go to track three. Well, it thinks it's at where it put track one, but really it's where I put track one. And it doesn't know that because I've reconnected the motor by releasing the switch and the relays go back to the rest position, reconnected the motor to the circuit board. So now I can read for a while on track one, but then I can tell, whoops, but then I can tell this thing to read track three. So here we go, track three. And you see it moved there. Very good, now back to track one. So it's moving the same distance as it did before according to the calculations, but um, I've adjusted it. And I should be able to do this at any point. 
So the, I have full experimentation to select any track and then move it from there. So there's there's a lot of combinations I could try, which really makes this a more uh, robust, universal uh, QIC tape reader tool. And thanks for watching.